Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhary again and I welcome everyone to my lecture class. In my today's class, I am going to talk about one more electrolyte imbalance that is hypercalcemia. I will discuss about the causes, approach, diagnosis and treatment of a case of hypercalcemia. So, let's see what is hypercalcemia. As per the definition, when the serum concentration of calcium goes above 10.3 mg per deciliter, or else, if the concentration of ionized calcium goes above 5.2 mg per deciliter, then it is considered as hypercalcemia. Now, what is the importance of calcium in our body? It is very much important for neuromuscular signaling. It is important for cardiac contractility, secretion of various hormones, and it is an important part of the blood coagulation. So, uh, let's see how the calcium balance is maintained in our body. But before that, I want to mention that 99% of our body's calcium remains in the bone. And only 1% calcium remains in the extracellular fluid. Among the 1% calcium, 50% is in ionized form. And the rest is bound to albumin. Okay, 99% of calcium remains in the bone, 1% remains in the extracellular fluid out of which 50% remains in the ionized form and rest remains tightly bound to the albumin. Now let's see what happens when there is a reduction in the extracellular fluid calcium. Whenever there is a reduction in the extracellular fluid calcium, there will be a feedback to the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid gland has some calcium sensor receptor which will sense there is a reduction in the extracellular fluid calcium. So, parathyroid gland will cause increase in the secretion of parathyroid hormone. This increased parathyroid hormone in turn will act on the bone as well as on the kidney. So, in the bone it will cause resorption of calcium from the bone and thereby this calcium will come into the extracellular fluid. In the kidney, it will cause or it will increase the tubular reabsorption of calcium, thereby resulting in increase in calcium level in the extracellular fluid. Now, kidney has one more function. Kidney also result in increased production of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D or which is the active vitamin D which in turn acts on intestine and results in increased absorption of calcium from the intestine. This is how the feedback mechanism works and the calcium balance in our body is maintained. Now see, what are the causes of hypercalcemia? First of all, there may be excessive parathyroid hormone production, okay, which results in hypercalcemia. 90% of the hypercalcemia are as a result of excessive parathyroid hormone production and hypercalcemia of malignancy. So what are the causes of excessive parathyroid hormone production? It may be due to primary hyperparathyroidism. Okay. Or it may be due to um, carcinoma in parathyroid gland. Or it may be due to a parathyroid hyperplasia or it may be due to parathyroid adenoma. 85% of cases of hyperparathyroidism is due to adenoma. Okay. And rest 15% are due to carcinoma or parathyroid gland hyperplasia. Now, if we talk about the hypercalcemia of malignancy, why there is hypercalcemia in case of malignancy? Because many of the solid tumors, they will produce something known as PTHRP. This is parathyroid hormone related peptide. So, this PTHRP will result in hypercalcemia because it will act on the parathyroid hormone receptors, in turn resulting in increased tubular reabsorption of calcium from the kidney as well as reabsorption of calcium from the bone. Hypercalcemia may, may be due to excessive production of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D also, which may be as a result of granulomatous disease like tuberculosis or may be due to sarcoidosis or may be as a result of lymphoma 
or may be as a result of iatrogenic vitamin D supplementation. Primary increase in bone resorption which may be due to as a result of hyperthyroidism or as a result of immobilization. Maybe as a result of excessive calcium intake which we see in milk alkali syndrome milk alkali syndrome or in case of total parenteral nutrition. Milk alkali syndrome is because of excessive intake of calcium containing antacids. There may be other reasons or less common reasons for hypercalcemia also. Some endocrine abnormalities like adrenal insufficiency. Okay, it may be as a result of pheochromocytoma or may be due to intake of certain drugs. For example, maybe due to thiazides or vitamin A intoxication. Okay, so these are the few important causes of hypercalcemia we come across. If you talk about the symptoms of hypercalcemia, mild cases of hypercalcemia, they go unnoticed. They are usually asymptomatic. But moderate to severe cases results in symptom. Symptoms may be neurogenic or may be related to GI, renal symptoms or symptoms due to osteopenia. Neurogenic symptoms can be fatigue. It may range from fatigue to stupor, depression, uh, personality changes up to coma also. In the GIT, it may cause nausea, vomiting or constipation. In the kidney or renal symptoms, it may result in polyuria, it may result in nephrolithiasis and severe cases of hypercalcemia will result in nephrocalcinosis ultimately leading to renal failure. In the bone, due to bony resorption, it will result in osteopenia and the patient may have repeated fractures even with trivial traumas also. Now coming to the diagnosis of hypercalcemia, first of all we need to look at the serum calcium level as well as albumin level. Why albumin? Because we have already mentioned that almost 50 percent of the uh, almost 50 percent of the extracellular fluid calcium is bound with the albumin. Okay. Now we want to know the corrected calcium. Okay. Once we have known the total calcium and serum albumin level, we can know the corrected calcium. So this is the formula by which we can know the corrected calcium. Corrected calcium is equal to measured calcium plus 0 0.8 into 4 minus albumin. That means for every 1 gram per deciliter rise of albumin, we need to add 0 0.8 milligram per deciliter with the measured calcium level. Okay. So this is the formula by which we get corrected calcium level. Then we need to check for the serum intact parathyroid hormone level. Okay. In a scenario where there is hypercalcemia with hypophosphatemia, and there is high level of serum intact PTH. That means it is a case of primary hyperparathyroidism. Okay. It may be also a case of familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So, rise in serum calcium, hypophosphatemia and rise in serum parathyroid can be can uh, have two differential diagnoses. One is hyperparathyroidism, the other one is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. And how do we differentiate? We need to do a sequence analysis for familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. It is an autosomal dominant condition where there is mutation in the calcium sensor receptors. It can also be differentiated from primary hyperparathyroidism by estimating the calcium clearance. The calcium clearance will be low in cases of FHH. It may be almost less than 20 mg per day. We need to measure the serum 125-dihydroxyvitamin D level to see if there is excess level of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D which may result in hypercalcemia. Serum phosphorus level also very important. In case of primary hyperparathyroidism, the serum phosphate level is low. Okay. But in cases of vitamin D intoxication, if it is a case of vitamin 
deintoxication then the phosphate level will be high so this is how from the serum phosphorus we can differentiate between the primary hyperparathyroidism and vitamin d3 intoxication very importantly we need to look for ecg also there are certain very important ecg finding in case of hypercalcemia there may be severe bradycardia av nodal block and very importantly there will be short qt interval so these are the few investigations which we'll be doing to find out the uh, uh, actual uh, actual cause of hypercalcemia if we talk about the treatment mild cases does not require an immediate treatment but if it is a case of severe hypercalcemia presenting with severe symptoms then immediate management is very much necessary first of all we need to administer fluid almost 4 to 6 liter of fluid to be administered over 24 hours which should be followed by administration of maintenance fluid that is 100 to 150 ml per hour because if there is hypovolemia it will result in decreased excretion of calcium thereby resulting in increase in hypercalcemia so fluid administration is very much necessary but with the fluid administration, if the patient develops volume overload and the hypercalcemia is still persisting, then we can use loop diuretics. Loop diuretics, they prevent the paracellular reabsorption of calcium. Okay, so this is how it can lower the calcium level. Next, very important drug is bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates, they will prevent the bony resorption of calcium okay so we usually be using iv or intravenous bisphosphonates in acute cases we can use zolindronate 4 milligram of zolindronate to be used or infused over 30 minutes pamidronate we can use we can use at a dose of 60 to 90 milligram over 2 to 4 hours it is contraindicated okay in case of renal insufficiency one more drug is calcitonin. We can use calcitonin. It also inhibits bone resorption. It can be used at a dose of 4 to 6 international unit per kg subcutaneously at an interval of 6 to 12 hour. It is not very potent. Okay, not very potent in case of hypercalcemia, but it is safer. Okay because it can be used in case of renal insufficiency also one more option is gallium nitrate it also prevents a resorption of calcium from bone it can be used at a dose of 200 milligram per meter square per day it should be used as a continuous infusion for five days it is also to be avoided in cases of renal failure we can also use glucocorticoids for the treatment of hypercalcemia. Basically, it is used for humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy or in cases of excess 125 for the vitamin D level. We can use hydrocortisone at a dose of 100 to 300 milligram per day or methylprednisolone we can use at a dose of 40 to 60 milligram per day. Now, ultimately, the patient may require dialysis also. Very severe cases of hypercalcemia or else if the patient is not improving and the patient is also having congestive heart failure or renal failure in these cases the patient will require immediate dialysis now lastly and very importantly treatment of underlying cause has to be done okay if we talk about primary hyperparathyroidism parathyroid uh, parathyroidectomy should be done but not in all the cases, the mild cases, asymptomatic cases, they have a benign course and they do not require any surgical intervention. But if it is a case of severe hypercalcemia or it is, uh, it is having the following condition, suppose serum calcium level is more than 1 milligram per deciliter above the upper limit or if there is calciuria of more than 400 milligram per day, if the patient is having renal failure or renal insufficiency, reduction in the bone mass or age less than 50 years if these criteria are fulfilled it is always best to undergo parathyroidectomy it will resolve the hypercalcemia but if there is no indication of parathyroidectomy the patient may undergo medical management also for medical management we will encourage the patient for liberal oral hydration with high salt intake 
there should be encouragement of physical activity to prevent the bony resorption of calcium and thiazide groups of drugs to be avoided because thiazide causes hypercalcemia if it is a case of malignancy then very importantly we need to treat the cancer and if we talk about the drugs glucocorticoids and bisphosphonates can be used to manage the hypercalcemia and we should be advising calcium restricted diet probably less than 400 mg per day so these are the important points regarding hypercalcemia i wanted to discuss today thank you so much for attending the class i hope it was helpful